You're talking about systems which have systems which have yep. systems which have systems. That's why it's a holy grail. And that's why it's a holy grail. Yes. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris talk about their personal holy grails in gaming. Things they'd like to see but might be impossible. Flies, World of Goo, Human Resource Machine, Hearthstone, The Knights of the Frozen Throne, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 110 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And our media topic of discussion for today is what I'm calling our holy grails of gaming. Um, I was thinking back a, a little bit. Grail? A grail? Uh, thinking back a oh little boy. bit to... Um, when I was in school, both undergraduate and graduate, and we'd have game design courses, uh, sometimes more experimental ones, where we would sort of just be talking theoretically about like, what if uh, what if we had AI that could do something that it can't do right now? What if a game could, you know, these things that right now at least seem impossible. Um, we were kind of talking about how it would affect our approach to design, what sort of games might be possible if these these impossible things were in fact possible. Sure, but but for us today, we're actually going to talk about our own personal holy grails. Yes. So it'll be things like, you know, what do, what do we personally hope that we can see maybe in the future of game gaming that for us is... You know, that's the pinnacle. That's the holy grail. That's what I want to see. Mm-hmm. And not just because we've talked a lot before about what we'd like to see, but what are those things that are almost kind of like pipe dreams, like sure. things we'd love to see but don't think are ever going to happen? Mm-hmm. Right. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So a couple years ago, I actually discovered a very strange little game. Um, it's called Little Inferno, but. The mechanics of the game um, were about burning things in your fireplace and ordering things in the mail to burn in your fireplace. And I think you might have actually talked about this on the cast I at some point. I think so, yeah. Um, and, and even the receipt you can burn in the fireplace. And you get virtual credits, and your goal is to burn all the things. Uh, that was created by a company, a game company, called the Tomorrow Corporation. And since then, they've worked on some other games also. Uh, World of Goo, maybe you've heard of, came out a while back. Right. Right. Um, and then um, I think fairly recently, one called uh, Human Resource Machine. And so I've been playing Human Resource Machine on the Switch. Worth noting, all three of those games that I just mentioned are available on the Switch, hmm. which is kind of cool. So I remember playing World, World of Goo, and I think um, Little Inferno I never played, mm-hmm. but those are both on the Wii. So yeah. they've been around for a little while. Yeah, they have. Well, they've made it to Switch, mm-hmm. uh, which is no great surprise. The Joy-Cons and also the touchscreen and all these other things, you know. So uh, what's interesting to me uh, about the human resource a machine as a game is it's it's almost less of a game and more of an educational tool to teach you how to uh, program on a fundamental fundamental logic level, not any particular language. Not uh, you're not learning to code. This is about if then statements. If then statements. Things have very specific behaviors mm-hmm. that you're thinking through. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying that if I play this game, then I will learn to think like a coder. Uh, you will need to think like a coder in order to be able to beat the game Mm, most certainly so we have the if then what is the if then else statement uh well actually there (laughs) isn't one Ah. Uh, it just follows the path so um, like if zero then then go do this Mm. if uh if negative number go do this but it's all about taking letters and numbers from the inbox and putting them in the out box and sometimes it's sort them alphabetically sometimes it's uh I want you to find all the prime numbers. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but you really have a limited set. There's only like about eight commands. You have an add command, you have a sub command, which is subtract. Um, you have the two that I mentioned about, you know, the, the ifs and there's just really not that much else. There's a copy, there's a a copy to copy, copy from, which is basically a paste. Um, but that's it. So instead of 
pulling from libraries of being able to multiply as a multiply function, you actually have to think about what is, on a fundamental level, what is the computer doing whenever it's multiplying? Because it's not multiplying. What it's doing is it's adding Mm -hmm. until it has a remainder and then telling you how many times it added the thing together. And so you've got to, you've got to create a, like a variable that's a tick variable and count it Hmm. and then go paste from it. And it, it, on this, on this like really, really gritty level is asking you to grok stuff that we just don't even think about. We take it for granted. Yeah. We totally take it for granted. And I loved that fundamental level of, can you make this work? Now you can play this in about a week. I did. Um, you can play it in an afternoon if you cheat. (laughs) And it's really kind of interesting to me because there's, um, cropped up all kinds of, of little, uh, boards now on how did you solve it? And there's some achieves that are built into it. Like, um, can you get it in under so many lines and, and commands? I mean, uh, and can you get it to run in under so many steps and that kind of a thing? And so people are like, I managed to do it in 12 steps. Check it out. Here's my, here's my program that, that does it in 12 steps. And so if there's this neat little community element to it too. All right. So that said, uh, I also want to throw out World of Goo, which is um, about taking these globs of goo and and they stick together and you build bridges and and you build these weird little terraces. It's a great game. It's fun. It's fun. It's fantastic. my, My major complaint with both of these games on Switch actually had to do with the choice of using the controls with the joy cons hmm. um now i have to admit are you talking like motion controls yeah the motion controls hmm. uh, for the most part with uh, human resources machine i actually pulled the the thing out and i used it as a uh, a mobile device with a touch screen like i would on my phone and and i actually kind of forgot i was playing on switch i actually just i just went to bed with it like i like do my phone sometimes and and was like oh yeah i'm just playing on my phone and i wasn't it just i was instantly in that space and forgot that But when I did have it up on the TV, I used the Joy-Cons. And the problem is that they've used this this neat solution, let's call it, where you just hit the X button to recenter at any point. Hmm. And what I found myself doing, maybe it was just me, was overcompensating with my motions. And so my hand would go off the edge of the screen, and then I'd recenter, and I'd bring it back and recenter. But because there's a scroll element, I was accidentally scrolling the screen away. And in order to be able to scroll it back, I had to recenter and scroll again. And I found my my hand after, let's say, three minutes of playing, like I'd have my hand up over my head or uh, up by my chest or like in this weird kind of Quasimodo <laughs> position mm-hmm. trying to get... Uh, and, and it's kind of like a badly designed VR. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I was all twisted about trying to get this to work. And that, and that was frustrating for me um, to the point where it, it hurt my gameplay. Because with World of Goo, if you do the wrong thing at the wrong time, you're going to send that piece of, of goo flying off the screen and you've lost the level. Um, so in that sense, I think that the port was a little bit unsuccessful. Um, but I think they're given the fact that the console literally has three or four or five different ways to play every single game with the controls. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to give world of goo a try with the touch screen, uh, but I've really been enjoying playing it on the big screen. So, um, all that is to say, uh, tomorrow corporation, I think is doing a great job. They have a cool aesthetic. They have this weird dystopian meta in every single one of their games. By the time you get to the end of the human resources, uh, machine game, you realize that you really are a human resource for the machines. Mm. And that's fun. Hmm. Um, so uh, give it a try. It's well, well worth it. Those games are worth, uh, they're about 10 bucks each. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's worth the time. Yeah, it seems really interesting. Very different from what I, what I think any of us are used to. Yeah, I'm super looking forward to their next game, whatever huh. it is. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. Okay, so Doc, I know this is uh, something that you and I have both been looking into. Uh, Hearthstone Knights of the Frozen Throne. Oh, yes. Uh, the the newest expansion, which actually, it, it could just be my perception, but it feels like it came out pretty quick after the um, 
uh, Angoro. Like the Angoro expansion. Yeah, I yeah. thought so too. Um, which that's not inherently a bad thing. Uh, more not. new content more quickly. So. But you know what? Angoro didn't have a, a single player mm-hmm. a mission attached to it. And that's what's interesting about this because typically they do one of two things with an expansion. Mm-hmm. It's either a whole new set of cards or, or it's an adventure that happens to have a few cards right. as rewards. This one is both. Um, now the it's difference, massive. yeah, it's it's a pretty big update. Um, the difference, though, being that the adventure, as unlike before, it's actually free. Um, you get to play through these levels for free, but the difference is that instead of getting a sort of like a specific set of new cards, the first. The, the first one you clear, you get a legendary card right. for free. Uh, but then after that, you just get a Frozen Throne pack. So it's really more of a challenge mode than mm-hmm. it is an adventure mode. Um, or at least that's how I would put it. That's a good way to put it. Um, and I know, Doc, that you didn't particularly like this, but they they even say up front that this one's going to be a very challenging one. Um, each of the bosses, like whereas before they would advise you to make a deck to take on each boss, um, this one you pretty much have to because yeah. they are so very specific mechanically. Um, and I think that it was because maybe people were complaining that it wasn't hard enough before, or maybe they just wanted to do something more of the style as an experiment. Maybe that's why they're not charging for it. Um, I personally found it interesting, but um, I think both of us are kind of a little bit upset that, uh, maybe not, upset's not even the right word, but whereas before... I could sort of go into a boss, recognize that like, oh, I could beat this if I had a control deck or I could beat this if I had an aggro deck. It's sometimes you would feel like you have to make a specific deck. Right. Mm. Here, you almost have to. Yes. Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, I absolutely loathed it. In fact, I dropped it after the first <laughs> tier. Uh, um, it, 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 it was so frustrating for me that I stopped having fun. Mm. And to me, it's about flow theory, um, which is that idea of being able to have the balance between player ability and uh, boredom, Mm -hmm. right? For me, the very first uh, proper boss, if you will, the one that that he, he was totally immune and you had to steal his cards in order to make those cards deal damage to him, um, that that was more like a puzzle mm. than it was about there's three or four or five different ways to beat this. Yeah, that's How true. How are they're, you going to beat it? They're very puzzle-like, yeah. Yeah, and so it was, you have to play this until you figure out um, what the trick is, and then hopefully you have the right cards to be able to build the deck to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to hate on the people who, who choose to hit the forums immediately and mm-hmm. be like, what's the solution? Okay, build this deck. And then they go and they play it and they, you know, they play with their own skill and talent and, and beat the thing. But I'm not one of those people. Um, I actually really dislike using pre-made decks. Mm-hmm. I love, uh, that challenge of doing it myself. Do I sacrifice the ability to get to high tiers by doing that? Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. But if I hit tier 13 on a given season, I'm happy. Yeah. I, I find myself content, mm-hmm. um, th- because I know I did it on my own and, the inability to get past a boss after an hour or two or three or four of play, true story, mm-hmm. um, was so frustrating for me that I literally looked over to my wife and said, they have stolen my fun on this one. Hmm. Um, and I was having a bad day anyway, so ah. I was a little grumpy. <laughs> yeah. And I did go back in and I did beat it later. Um, but I know that there's more tears that are unlocked, like you said. Mm-hmm. I haven't really been interested in going and doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just not in the right mood. Mm-hmm. I will say, though, that uh, I really enjoyed the prologue, that very first mission. Now, the first mission prologue it, was so clever. It, it's very linear, but it, it was a storytelling It's completely level. constructed. Um, and it was really funny because the first half, you're fighting the Lich King, and the Lich King is kind of coming across as this sort of hyper-competitive Hearthstone player. They're talking about, like, oh, this is going to hurt your rank, and, like, oh, man, you know, this is this is just my opening hand. Like, I'm not even, like, you know, this I'm just getting my started. final form, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you eventually uh, get wiped out because this deck is super overpowered, and your deck is underpowered, and it's like, hey, reinforcements are coming in X turns, mm-hmm. and you can tell immediately that you're not going to get there right uh and it's like oh you got to be kidding me (laughs) and so um you die and you get brought back as a death knight right um this is mirroring what happens in world of warcraft when they came out the frozen throne expansion yeah um and uh it's hilarious because then you're fighting the side that was coming to rescue you turns out it wasn't much of a rescue anyway because Mm -hmm. uh it, it was things like um oh what was it like 
over eager rogue, um, uh-huh. like uh-huh. An entitled something or other incompetent warrior so making fun and, of it. Yeah. And they're like, why aren't you taunting? Like all these very sort of like meta things uh-huh. that you would remember from world of Warcraft. Um, so it was it was just hilarious. And so even if that's the only one you play, you definitely should uh, just for fun. Yeah, everybody should play the first level. Um, but then just speaking more generally about the expansion, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm intrigued by the new lifesteal mechanic. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I'm also very intrigued by the Death Knight cards. Um, I am too. That turn your hero into a different form of your hero. Mm-hmm. Um, usually there's some sort of battle cry effect. Um, that will give you a little bit of a boost, but then also you get a new special ability, um, other things like that. So I think they always add like 15 armor or something like that too. So it's kind of boosting your health as well, giving you kind of a second wind. It's very, very much a different Mm -hmm. way to play. Yeah. They've had sort of hero transformation abilities before, like your hero is replaced with this one. Right. Or the power Um, was replaced or something. Um, but this is the first time they've kind of had a hybrid approach to that. Mm-hmm. That's just changing your character, not literally switching characters as it has been before. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually when that happens, it's kind of like always a set um, health. And so you're kind of thinking about when do I want to do it? Because you want to be in a position to be advantaged with mm-hmm. that lower health start. Um, whereas with this one, I think you could play it pretty much at any time and have a good advantage. So timing's still important, but it's not in the same way as the other one. So I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd agree with that. They also changed their voice lines, which is kind of fun. Yeah, so. that is fun. Overall, I think it was a successful expansion. Uh, if it's been a while since you've been into Hearthstone, it's a great time to jump back into it. There's yep. lots of new stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that they've been having some fun with the Tavern Brawls, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they've really upped their game with that. And um, they had a couple of festivals and, and sort of... I, one of my favorite things about World of Warcraft was the holidays. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think that if they really keep going in that flow, I could see myself... Uh, keeping it installed again, mm-hmm. shall we say. That actually even has me intrigued because I always was a big fan of the the holidays in World of Warcraft. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just bringing back that aesthetic might encourage me to play, um, at least play a little bit of a game that I don't mm-hmm. particularly enjoy. In Every October rolls around and I go, ooh, should I get back into World of Warcraft for a couple months? Just because the holiday season and wow. Was, I've done was that a couple greatest. of times, like in, installed yeah. it just to go on and kind of run around and yeah. do the holiday quests just for yeah. fun. Yeah. And yeah. Another thing that might get you interested in bringing coming back on. I know that doc, you're one of those who likes to build your own decks. I do. Um, that's totally cool. I'm one of those that I like, I like to experiment with that. But then when I'm finding that it's just not working, I like to net deck at least as a starter. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a thing on the PC where I think curse gaming does this. They have this uh, kind of third party external thing you can use called the innkeeper. And what it will do is catalog all your cards that you have and, um, sort of keep that in mind to like what your collection is. Yeah. Um, so when you go onto their website, Hearthpone, uh, PWN, you're able to, um, look for decks, for example, show me only decks that I could build right now. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you can't build it right now, let's tell you how much dust it's going to cost. So you can see like, Oh, I'm, I could afford this and it's only going to cost me like 900 dust or something like that. Um, and then the other handy thing is that whereas before I used to sort of be looking at that page and have to like be, okay, I need one of these, yeah, two of these, yeah. searching for it. One of the reasons I never did it. When you have Innkeeper installed, you're actually able to copy the deck from Hearthpone, go into Hearthstone, and build the deck automatically. That's neat. Um, so that's super handy. Uh, so if ever you've been thinking about getting back into it and you want to sort of like be boosted by having other people's decks to help you out, um, Innkeeper's a very handy tool for that. Pro tip. So you can wreck. Get wrecked. Mostly that. Sometimes first impressions don't tell the whole story. Can passion linger? Or is it doomed to burn brightly, then fade away? To find the answers, we ask, are you still playing? So Jim, a couple weeks ago you were talking about Arkham Knight. Uh, Are you still playing that? No, I am not. Ah, why would that be? <laughs> um, I'll probably get back to it, but to be honest with you, it got really repetitive. Hmm. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I picked up a new game, uh, Yakuza Kiwami, which I talked about last week, mm-hmm. um, because I realized I'm just not having fun in Arkham Knight anymore. Mm. And I was kind of either forcing myself to play it, because I'm like, well, I, I, if I want to play a video game, I should play this one that I've already invested in, right? Right, yeah. Or I would just not play a video game and just watch, you know, some movie or something. I started thinking, this is silly. Why should I play this game 
just to say that I can beat it or because I bought it when I'm not enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I put it away and maybe I'll go back and I'll finish beating it, but the missions are vi- so similar. Um, I'm pretty far in the game. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm about 70, 75%, I think in, in terms of beating the main storyline. Mm-hmm. So I've gotten pretty far, but all the side quests, everything was just too, too similar. And, um, the Riddler parts with all the Batmobile driving mm-hmm. was just obnoxious. Really all the Batmobile missions were just obnoxious. And, um, the recapture towers, which I thought would be cool to reclaim the city. I like the concept, mm-hmm. but they're all so similar. It's like you're just redoing the same thing over yeah. and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, I really felt like Arkham Knight suffered from sequelitis. We talked about that a little bit, I think, oh, when, yeah. a few weeks back. Um, it, it very much felt like we're just doing another Arkham City, and we're just going to tack on a lot more elements to it, including yeah. the Batmobile. Mm-hmm. But a lot of other things too to kind of make it feel like a bigger version of that game. And bigger isn't always better, you know. Sometimes a more focused experience is better. Mm-hmm. Really, the best game in that series for me is still Arkham Asylum, mm. which was not an open world game, which was Mm-mm. which was inside these little rooms. Mm-hmm. But I felt it was more focused. Arkham City, I felt did a good job of opening it up to the city. Um, but here, I just think it's too much, and it's a little bit of a disappointing end to what I consider to be. Uh, probably the best still i would consider it to be the best trilogy of you know comic book games basically mm-hmm. translated to, but that's not really a high bar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah no i have i have stopped playing um maybe i will go back one day uh i i did out of curiosity because the the hints that jason todd was arkham knight were so <laughs> strong because i i expected it right from the gate right when he was announced but the hints were so strong because they kept introducing Jason Todd flashbacks into the story, into the narrative. Um, Batman kept having them more and more. So, of course, it was made it very clear who Arkham Knight was. So, out of curiosity, I just looked it up on online because I was pretty certain. And, of course, I was right. But it's such a letdown that they went that direction. He already had a Red Hood, a character that was essentially the same character. And yet they made up a new one and then put the same person in. It just doesn't none of it made sense Hmm. it just didn't it just felt like they thought they were being either creative or clever by doing this and it was neither that seems to be a trend actually in um batman games uh telltale being another example where they kind of have their own take on the canon i i wonder if it's because they're trying to be surprising it's like oh yeah i know this story already and so they're kind of trying to throw a wrench into it i don't mind them having their own take because they were doing that here too they have tim and Barbara in a romantic relationship, which does not happen in the comics either. It's actually Dick and Barbara. So I, I get that. I get that they're they're making some changes here and there, but this one was just unnecessary because the Red Hood character is basically the Arkham Knight. I mean, a little bit less militant, but he does use guns. Mm-hmm. So it just to me, why not just use Red Hood? There's no point if it's Jason Todd. Why just why call him something else just because he because Arkham Knight looks more like Batman? That's stupid. Why would you want another character? Well, well, because you see, it would be a combo breaker. You'd have Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, and then Red Hood. You know, I'm not saying you call it (laughs) game Red Hood, Um, but yeah, I just or or they could have a different character in there. But um, the only thing worse would have been if they revealed that it was actually Joker and he was alive the whole time and now he's Arkham Knight. Mm. That would have been Mm. much worse because that would have made zero sense. Um, anyway, so that's me. Uh, but Chris, I have a challenge for you. Oh. And are you still playing? Uh, what about Overwatch? Oh yeah, I haven't talked about Overwatch recently. Um, I am still playing it, and R- still, yes. Wow. Um, not not like religiously. It's kind of like one of those things where I'm not playing it any more and le- or less than I have been. Um, but it's an interesting phenomenon because I actually have more and more people in my circle who do play it a lot more than I do who are kind of down on it right now. Um, A lot of them are kind of thinking that when destiny two comes out, they're just going to switch to that and never touch Overwatch again. I've heard a lot of rumblings of that myself, Um, which is kind of interesting, especially given that blizzard is uh, hosting destiny two on their, on their servers now. Um, That's ironic. So yeah, like you, you boot up the blizzard launcher and there's overwatch and starcraft and warcraft and destiny two. But no, I mean, I, I like it. And I think a lot of the things that people are kind of complaining about is it has to do with the meta. And this is going to happen anytime you have a competitive driven game. Uh, everyone's going to kind of feel gypped if their character has a balance tweak. And it's not even so much about the characters as it is about the ranking system and competitive play. Um, basically, there's 
from what I understand, kind of a hidden stat that is your, if you, for lack of a better term, kind of like your player skill. Um, but that's separate from your season ranking, which is uh, a, a score that kind of puts you into categories from bronze to um, top 500. Hmm. People tend to get matched up partially on their player skill, and then your points go up and down whether or not you lose um, each match. Uh, that, that SR rank goes up and down. But the, the way they place you is kind of based on, initially, it's based on the player skill. And so people have all these complaints about uh, like you know the way that they make it work or don't make it work. Um, they have complaints about about um you know like kind of things like one of the big problems recently has been uh, what they call leavers people who will leave a competitive game early and they make it a five on six match or even worse and right. then at that point you're pretty, pretty much guaranteed to lose a brand new phenomenon yeah. that has never <laughs> um, happened before. but but there's no backfill in competitive um mm-hmm. so people like will be down a player the entire time and sometimes it's disconnects but other times it's people who just like decide for whatever reason they don't like the team comp and so they leave and leave everyone else out in the wind mm-hmm. um and it gets it's it's especially bad in higher ranks the community seems to be growing a little bit more toxic you know like it was always like there's always a little bit of toxicity in online games but overwatch actually seemed to have a pretty good vibe for the most part it's kind of getting worse over time um the cool people are leaving and the jerks are staying i mean is it really getting is, is it getting worse or are people just have a higher expectation. It could also be perception. Now. Yeah. But, but part of it too, I think w- what you're, what people have called toxic before, mm-hmm. not to get too far off, off tra- topic here, but what people have called toxic before when they refer to things like this, is really just the natural inclination for people when they are anonymous, which they are in this, in this case to basically, you know, cut someone down for what they think is letting the team down. Mm-hmm. I mean, this happens in, in games, that's always happened in games. And so if you're if you're new to the game and everyone else is new to the game, it's not going to be as common because mm-hmm. everyone's kind of in the same boat. But if you're not, I mean, I, I've experienced this. I think all of us have going all the way back. You know, you see this stuff in, in early 3D games. I remember Return to Castle Wolfenstein. I played religiously with some friends, basically, to a point where we would just play constantly. We were constantly, um, you know, among the, the top players in that game, um, FPS. And... People, I mean, if you were not playing well in that game, it was brutal. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would just be brutalized. But at the same time, it's it's something that you sh- you expect. That's just, that's that's the. I don't know. I, I just don't like the throwing around the word toxic mm-hmm. because I think it's more people are just not as accustomed to maybe maybe it's just because more people are gamers now. But it's just it's it's talking shit. <laughs> it's what it is. It's talking shit to people about a game that ultimately doesn't matter like it doesn't mean anything if someone Mm. says that you suck at this game is it really that big of a deal it's not even so much when i say toxic i don't just mean the way people speak i mean the way that they end up letting that affect how the game works so again the levers phenomenon yeah or you'll get people who will start throwing a match if they don't get their way that sort of Mm -hmm. thing and because it is team driven if it's like you know if it's a death match then fine if someone's screwing around then you just you just wipe them out but if you get the people who are dragging the rest of the team down because they don't like that someone's playing Hanzo, then, you know, it's it's a totally different to play. story. If you're on if you're on a team with a bunch of friends and you have that one extra guy that you don't like who's horrible and you just keep you tell him to leave and he refuses to leave, then uh, you all as a group just team kill him constantly every time he spawns <laughs> until he leaves. There's is no friendly a, fire in that. Never watch. Right. So, no, but, but this is that's because it's a baby. Be. It's a child's game. Mm-hmm. It's a child's game. You need to have friendly fire. But, wow. Um, wow, Jim. Since you're hate. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I mean, just kind of to wrap this Hot up quickly. Takes. Um, there are a lot of people who, and I think part of it too, is that when you play it as much as some of these people do, you kind of become hyper-focused on what you think yes. the problems yeah. are. For me, who doesn't play it all that often, um, I think it's still an excellent game. I think Blizzard is doing a really great job of making incremental changes to try to adapt to the problems that they're seeing. Um, they're still reimagining characters here and there, like Mercy and Diva are getting these really big overhauls are going to change the meta a lot in some really good ways, I think. Um, they just came out with a deathmatch mode uh, that sort of changes the way you play Overwatch. It's just an arcade thing, but mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's cool and Heard it's fun. Um, and they just finished recently the Summer Games. You mentioned you like the holidays. Mm-hmm. They still have very frequent, really neat events that add new skins sometimes new game modes a little seasonal um, things yeah the summer games 2017 brought back lucio ball which is something they did and the first one's kind of like rocket league but you're playing as ah, lucio 
Oh, neat. Um, and they actually had a competitive version of that this year where you could do placements just like it was competitive, everything else. Um, I actually placed really well um, and got some cool rewards for that. So, cool. um, yeah, it's it's still a great game, I think, and I'm probably going to keep playing it. I just remember, whenever someone is doing absolutely terribly with your favorite character, that is insurance against them nerfing your favorite character <laughs> because it's changing the meta and making the overall stats for that character worse. Exactly. When people are terrible, it's a good thing. Yeah. Doc, Doc's <laughs> thinking about this correctly. Yeah. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. So it's not often that we do um, just straight up sort of musical discussion here, but there's a new album that came out that I want to talk about called uh, Of Earth and Axe in Act One. This is from the band Xanthacroid. Um, that's spelled X. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, X-A-N-T-H-O-C-H-R-O-I-D. And I did that without looking. I feel I feel special. I'm impressed. Thank that's you. really, really good. I don't um, believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but what's kind of interesting about this, it's a... It's a metal band. It's a kind of um, melodic metal. Um, they have some death metal influences, but they also have um, symphonic metal. Symphonic metal is a good way to put it, actually, okay. because they actually will have um, a score that kind of accompanies the guitar and the drums and all that stuff that you'd expect. Um, and it's also um, set in this fantasy world that they've kind of been developing. And it's not a totally new thing for people to have a world that they sort of set their music in, especially for sort of concept albums. Jim, before we talked or before we started, you were talking about the Rush um the Rush. Yeah. The, the band's just called Rush. Well, no, the, the Rush album. I was trying to remember the, the name of it. 2112. 2112. Phenomenon. Yeah. The Rush Phenomenon. So, so you were talking about Rush 2112. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, this, what they're doing with their IP, if you will, is they have a world they've sort of been building, and all the albums follow one or one of two um, brothers um, that kind of have their own story. And you could actually they've gone through before and showed you um all of the songs and their discography thus far in chronological order so if you wanted to you could go back and listen like a lot of the albums now ever since their first ep i want to say hmm. um are all chronological unto themselves the first one kind of went back and forth so that's kind of mixed in with all the other things but you could actually go through and make a playlist and listen through the story in chronological order via the music which is kind of neat um this particular album was actually, they started off, it was going to be a two-part, or just kind of like a long, long album, uh, about 90 minutes or so, that they split into two separate albums. So there's Act 1 and Act 2 is going to be coming out in October. Mm. Um, and it's got a very different sound for them. Um, the second one's going to sort of move back to the heavier style they've had before. But this one has a lot of great sort of like melodic parts, um, but it's a good... It feels like a narrative. And this is one of the things I really love about it because it has a sense of progression. And even if you're not really listening to the lyrics, the first time I listened to it, what lyrics I was catching and just the sound, Mm -hmm. I could sort of get a sense for the story that was being told, which is kind of about how um, these two brothers who are estranged for a while, one comes back and kind of becomes power hungry and they end up sort of parting ways and become enemies. That's pretty cool. I mean, that, that kind of stuff, it's kind of my jam, to be honest. I love that the storytelling with music mm-hmm. um one of my one of the bands i listen to a lot i've listened to both of their albums often uh the proto men which you may have heard of they did they did something similar where they had an act one and an act two album and they're supposed to be working on act three they have been for years it's mm-hmm. just not out yet um but it's basically a retelling of the mega man story oh neat <laughs> Very cool. uh, and, and and they are also a um a rock band so i mean it's it's also fun but it just tells us tells a a basically a dystopian version of Mega Man, mm-hmm. which I find um, very interesting. But yeah, this this uh, Zan- Xanthocroid, mm-hmm. you said Xanthocroid, Xanthocroid, yeah, Xantho, okay, mm-hmm. not Xanthro. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a really fantastic album uh, musically. Uh, I definitely recommend it to pretty much anyone, even if you're not necessarily into metal. Um, what's, what's the album itself? Just it's called Of Earth and Axon Act One. Okay, um, and that's spelled E R T H E, Earth. It's uh, it's kind of like one of the the races in this world. Um, and uh, they actually have a pretty neat thing with the digital version where you can have a, um, they call it a listening guide that kind of has the lyrics, but also parts of narration. They're kind of de- describing uh, either sort of like things visually happening, people having a conversation that's not in the lyrics, that sort of deal. And it kind of enhances your understanding of the story. Um, so I listened through the first time without that. But then the second time or so um, I read along, it's like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Um, 
also thought I'd mention just real quick, our very own Nick Kruger, who does the music for our show, um, did a chiptune cover of a few of the songs from this album. Uh, oh, really cool. So uh, if you're into chiptune, um, you can definitely uh, check out Nick's uh, remixes of these and uh, hear how that ends up translating. It's pretty neat. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. Something popped up on my radar uh, last week I thought it was pretty cool, and that was Suro. Uh, it's spelled T-S-U-R-O, and it's a board game I've had for a long time. It's been one of my, my favorite little um, abstracts. It's called The Game of the Path, and basically you have little square tiles. You throw them down onto the board and call it a checkerboard fashion, but... The tiles you're putting down have little snake-like uh, looking lines on them, and you can play with, I think it's like eight players, um, and your stone follows the path, and the goal is to outlast everyone else. Well, what's neat about it is it's a very quick game. You can play it in five, maybe ten minutes, and it's a nice little sort of casual party game, filler, that sort of thing, at you're, game night. You're trying not to go off the board. Right. And you're so trying to lead you off the board. First, you first one to, yeah, first mm-hmm. one to, uh, or last one to stay on the board mm-hmm. wins basically. And if you crash into somebody else, you're gone. And there's all these little subtleties, but, but it's actually, um, it's one of those easy to learn, mm-hmm. uh, difficult to master mm-hmm. kind of a concept. It's very, very, um, elegant. Yes, it is. And it's also very Zen, mm-hmm. but the cool thing about it is you can have eight players, you know, all around it while everybody else goes to to dinner and comes back on game night or you're waiting for someone to show up or just whatever, right? It's a great little game. Well, so the neat thing is that now it has come out as an app and, uh, it's available for, um, for iPad and for, um, you know, well, I, I Andro- should, I shouldn't limit. Is it, lim- I is it on limit Android, myself. Android tablets as well? Uh, yes, it is. Cause that's what I have. Um, and, and, and so basically what I'm trying to say is it's on, uh, it's on tablets. It's also on phones, but what you can do is, uh, you can actually play with new victory conditions, game modes, huh. that I would say are enhanced by the digital element of it. And what I mean by that is you're now playing for number of loops or longest path, things like that, that would be extremely hard to calculate yeah. if you were playing on the game board. Hmm. So what you can do then is um, actually challenge. There's a challenge mode. You can uh, tie it into Facebook. Uh, you can, uh, I was going to say, does it have online multiplayer? Yes, it has all the online multiplayer. You can, you can do all the old things you could do, but plus more. And what I really love about this, um, new trend of taking these little board games, especially the abstracts and putting them into the digital space is whenever they think outside the box, pun intended, Mm -hmm. and they really add new stuff that is enhanced by that digital space. Right now, because it's such a new app, it's a little unstable. Mine, uh, I found, crashed quite a bit. Um, but there is a what's called basically a, a low-res mode, and, and they're working on it, and they're pushing out updates. So I think probably by the time you hear this, they, they'll even have that fixed. Um, but it's called Suro, T-S-U-R-O, and last week at least, um, it was a free pick because the, the editor's choice uh, noted it, and, and that's how I got it. So I didn't even have to pay for the thing. Oh, wow. But um, keep an eye on it. It's, it's really cheap, and it's really fun. Yeah, I've I've played the um, the board game version, so I'm I'm definitely yeah. interested in the digital version. And everything it, from the board cool game, game transfers over. And it's as I recall, it's real simple, real oh, quick. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, super simple, super fun. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. To uh, kind of introduce our media topic, again, we're going to be talking about our personal holy grails in gaming. And what I mean by holy grails are kind of the things that we'd like to see, kind of these theoretical things that's like, hey, what if games could do blank? Yeah. Um, I think that's a good way to, to preface it, too, because I don't want to lock us into anything that's, say, just about processing power. Mm-hmm. And so just as an example, something that came up very frequently, both in theoretical discussions in class, but also uh, as a grad student, sort of working on projects or being somewhat involved or aware of projects that were uh, grants and that sort of thing, Uh, the sort of um, unrealistic expectations that would come from your clients or your stakeholders uh, that like they would say, for example, oh, why can't we just talk to the computer and have it talk back? It's like, well, if you can either give us like several billion more dollars to make that work or, you know, wait 10 years at least until we have something that could come possibly close to that. Um, so that would be an example of a holy grail is the ability to have a natural conversation with a computer that's actually believable. Um, and so 
I don't know. Do you guys have any other examples of holy grails, I, or kind of what are you, what are yours? So I, I actually have one. I thought about this, mm-hmm. and I wanted to make it something that I think is feasible, technologically possible, possibly feasible technologically, but it's very difficult to implement from a design standpoint. Mm-hmm. So kind of, I'm coming at this from a different angle. Instead of our technology is limited, which I think there are some limitations here. But I think it's more of a, we might be limited in trying to figure out how this works. Maybe we don't have the controllers yet to do this. So, and and perhaps that could be it. It could be an issue of control or Mm -hmm. not having uh, the right controller. So I've been playing a lot of of action games recently. Another one that I played was uh, Yakuza Kiwami. I played uh, Nier Automata not too long ago. And mine is actually based on the way that action works. And same thing with Batman Arkham. Arkham Knight in the Arkham series. So there is this sort of disconnect between some games have a fight simulation, like boxing games or UFC, um, or even even uh, like wrestling games, WWE games. It's, like, it's a simulation of moves that people can actually perform. And then others have, I want to look cool when I fight, even if it's unrealistic, like to look like Batman. Right or in Yakuza, it's the same deal. You have these extra combo moves that you can do that make you look like a badass that you might see in a movie. The problem comes when we cannot actually empower the player to, for example, take out enemies in the way that Batman can do it with dodging and reactions. And you grab them and you pick them up and you throw them over your shoulder and you break their arm and then you flip them and you do all these like complicated back and forths. So instead, the sort of workaround the band-aid that developers are using are to mix in quick time events or like a special move that you okay now i have a special like in yakuza kawami i have a special now i click triangle and i pull off this really elaborate really cool move that does a lot of damage so what i want is my holy grail mm -hmm. is to have a combat system where you can both look cool you can still look cool you can look awesome you can do all of these Um, maneuvers that you might see in, say, you know, like a kung fu movie where there are all these really cool fighting styles and all these different reactions. But with complete control, real time, no QTE. So in a word, perhaps uh, improvisation. Yeah. The ability to on the fly do whatever it is you think you, you want to do. Right. Yeah. And there's lots of limitations of why we can't do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, It could processing power probably is part of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways that games try to get around this fact. I mean, obviously, sl- uh, bullet time, mm-hmm. slow down, that's one way to try to slow things down. So mm-hmm. now it might feel like you can do it more quickly. Um, but yeah, I don't think that we're, we're not there yet. Yeah. And it, it may be a, a, a long time before we can get here. Yeah. Like maybe the, the closest thing I can think of that has like, in a sense, true freedom to fight however you want is something like say, um, Torabash, which basically it was it was odd. It was a weird way to approach it, but it was basically a turn based thing where you can basically control each individual joint and muscle and stuff like that in order to say I'm going to contract or extend this muscle or I'm going to bend or lock this joint, that sort of thing. And it was extremely complicated and hard to control because you had to like really understand if not how the body works, how these bodies work. Um, but in theory, if you knew what you were doing, you can have them do flips and spins and but kicks and punches. And that's not really what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, and I, I'm with you. I'm yeah. just saying that's probably like the closest attempt we've had so far. And I think really the only thing that's going to get us there, and this is the other the other thing that maybe is like kind of adding upon your holy grail, is not just the improvisation and like kind of the ability to make any decision, but also how you have that be executed without requiring the player to be a martial artist themselves. Because you could, in theory, have like one-to-one controls and make like a theoretical full immersion VR setup, right? But then, like, if I gamers I, are fat and lazy, yeah. man, we do well, not. I, want I'm, it. I'm not Batman, but I could right. think as if I were Batman. I, I played my Connect for 15 minutes and it never played it again. Right? Mm-hmm. No, it's not. It's not the. I don't think that VR is the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a matter of controls Mm -hmm. i mean maybe maybe it's a matter of mixing in what you can do in a fighting game with a 3d environment type game maybe Mm -hmm. there's some some sort of connection there i think um but i do think that it's 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 in part a processing issue Mm -hmm. but i think it's also in part a design problem yeah trying to figure out how do these controllers work maybe we're not going to get there until we get to something where you're controlling games with your mind Mm -hmm. you know we might it might be we literally can't respond quickly enough to do it unless we were legitimate 
martial arts, but if mm-hmm. it's just, oh, I can think and do it kind of game, mm-hmm. then sure, that's perfectly feasible. You wouldn't have to be standing up and doing the moves yourself. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so this could be so way we, far off. We need the Matrix. We need the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I know Kung Fu. Yeah. Uh, so what are y'all, what are some of y'all's holy grails? Any, any spring to mind? Oh, man. You know, I think the low-hanging fruit for this one is the ability for a, a computer to tell a story. You know, an actual um, generated story, right? So that would have been my answer 10 years ago. It no longer is for a number of reasons. I actually am not looking for that anymore. But uh, what I will say is, instead... Is that because the Teddy Ruxpin already did, did that? Yeah, that's totally the reason. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I, <laughs> I honestly think that, um, that there's a human element that we can't replicate and we shouldn't try to. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because people have been talking for a little while now, like as machine learning is becoming more prevalent and that sort of deal. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are theorizing that uh, even the jobs that we think robots can never replace, eventually they're going to be able to. But I think that even with machine learning, everything, like the, every creative thing, artistic, musical, whatever that mm-hmm. a machine will make, mm-hmm. is ultimately derived from human tendencies. Yeah, I agree. Um, and... We can do a lot of stuff with like randomness, but then that that's not necessarily appreciable by humans, no, at least not, not really. yet. Um, if randomness kind of becomes the or procedurality and randomness becomes kind of like the the new standard that everyone likes, and we end up enjoying that, mm-hmm. that's that's one thing. But um, I, I really do think that a lot of creative things um, machines aren't going to be able to do it the same way because right. they can't be truly creative unless it's a true like sapient ai mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, they're, they're basically just approximating creativity yeah based on the parameters that you give them or mm-hmm. unless procedurally we have, generating content yes but in the end and that would be the case unless we're talking about a true artificial intelligence right. in which case one i think we're way far off mm-hmm. and two i feel that if we do create artificial intelligence it's probably going to have better things to do mm-hmm. with its time than you know, make a video like BR, like video game storyteller in real time. Yeah, like manage traffic. No. Well, I'm no. just that kind of opens up a whole new ball yeah. of worms with yeah, that I, one. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like mean, artificial like, intelligence. Yeah, if, if, if we, we force it to do something like that, we're forcing an intelligent yeah. thing, which essentially, in some ways, <laughs> has life to to do something for for our benefit yeah. without any the, input. That's just, what is that sounds like slavery to the, me. Yeah, this is a totally separate ethics question. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to we, go we, we too don't far have, down there. We, we don't right? have time for it on this right. podcast. Well, I, I, I think I think we need to to step back from the human element and, and and say if we want a computer to drive our car and do it intelligently, what's the best animal that's the analog for that? Is it a bee? You know, is it is it a dog? Is it something like that instead of being a human? You know what I'm saying? Because um, I think when you're specifically talking about the most human thing we do, I'm going to pause there for dramatic effect. Mm, the most human thing oh, is that we do. Be, be really, really horrible and mean to each other while playing video games? No, it's tell stories. <laughs> oh, I, I was close. We tell stories. I, honestly, I think that... Um, I think we we story told ourselves into existence. Yeah. Um, you know, I I think that that's... Uh, a super important thing is this idea of sitting around the fire um, Mm -hmm. back, you know, 10,000 years ago and our brains growing because we developed language because we had warmth and we had the comfort to be able to actually grunt in meaningful ways. I think that that, that literally made us who we were. Um, Mm -hmm. And so to ask a computer to do that is it's, it's stripping away the core of who we are. Okay. So anyway, that all of that was to say, I want to just set that one aside because that, that one I think is a whole other show. Um, my answer to the Holy Grail question is actually um, to do with augmented reality. Um, if, if you look at the, the Pokemon phenomenon, for example, po- Pokemon Go, right? Right. Um, that was a, a magic moment uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, where this sort of um, special specialized database of locations existed because of the things that had been done in the world mapping projects. Um, it, the, the IP happened to be accessible to the same uh, dev company as, say, the Google data, as also the, uh, the other games that had come before it. And it all just sort of 
became this happy accident of perfection of now we can make an augmented reality game that, that exists in the real world. And I, I fear that without some serious licensing, we're not going to see another one on that scale for a long time. Um, I, I fear that we're not going to see something that is that ambitious and robust for a while. Wasn't, I mean, couldn't you say that Pokemon Go did have a serious license? behind it it did but that's my point i'm saying um aside from so you're that saying, one you're saying we would need another i'm, I'm saying i want this to be a genre mm-hmm. i want this to be something that that is is big and it's a phenomenon and and pokemon go had its moment and, and it was a summer and it fizzled basically and the reason why it fizzled is because they stripped out a bunch of features that they wanted and then they slowly added them back in but everybody was gone by that point right. nobody cared um it's actually a really great game now that i personally don't play um so what i want is that again only i want it to be something else uh, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of possibilities star wars harry potter Uh, One that came to mind for me was um, Legend of Zelda. Zelda would be very interesting. Like you go into a to a building, um, and or you look outside a building, and it looks like the entrance to a dungeon. Mm -hmm. You go inside, and now you're inside a dungeon. Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Oh, there's one. There's definitely this one. I mean, this whole idea. You create a world. Uh, You could do it, but um, it would be this idea of there's a there's a magical world that it coexists with our world, and you know, like Dresden, basically. Or, you know, even Supernatural, which is a terrible show. Uh, Whoa, hey, hold I on. I know, right? Well, it, it was fine for the first seven seasons or something. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was really good Actually, for a I, while. I, I liked the first four or five seasons. Yeah, it, it just went way off but, the rails you know, after Buffy, that. It's, a, it's the same thing. It's the same thing rehashed. It's that there's a dark world that exists right. beyond our world and you can't see it. Well, guess what? I have a magical Sheikah slate and I can see it. And, and that's the point. So this is what I want, is something that takes Pokemon Go to the next step and at a better granularity. So it's not just a forced perspective illusion of, oh, uh, I can move my phone around and, oh, there's, there's uh, Pikachu on the table. And now, look, I move my phone slightly. And, oh, he's across the Grand Canyon and he's <laughs> enormous. You know what I'm saying? AR technology, though, is uh, advancing very quickly. It um, is. Apple is having, like, they've been showing off their new AR stuff yeah, that's coming up with the next great. generation of phones. Oh, if, if you you've ever seen some of the stuff they do in in the lego store with mm-hmm. ar it's brilliant you, you hold the box up to the camera and what you see is yourself holding the lego uh, construct uh built and it, and it comes together in the lego way you huh. know? it's so cool so so what you're saying though doc is that what we could have is mario kart we can have our our, our all of the windows in our car our windshields be ar screens that can show us other cars as go karts. What a terrible idea! But yes, let's, and wait, you can, let's wait until we have self driving cars before we oh, do that. And you can, you can pick oh, no, because then you're not actually playing Mario Kart. And then you're not you, you got to pick up those little uh, little question mark things to get like an item. So you got to swerve really quickly to make sure that you hit it. But that's okay. You can bump into another car. It's Mario Kart, mm-hmm. right? Well, let me put this a different way. You know the you know the Tetris effect. Whenever you first learned to play Tetris and then you went out into the real world and you looked at the skyline of your city and you were like seeing Tetris blocks falling from the Mm -hmm, sky mm -hmm. and filling them in because your brain had encountered a thing it had never encountered before Mm -hmm. and, and you were still in that space. What if we could do that? Maybe not with Tetris, maybe with something else. But that's my point. If, if we look at this as the AR genre, then you could take any game and throw it out into the real world using a completely different mentality. Um, and that's what I'm worried won't happen because I think that that, that magic confluence of the right data with Google and Pokemon and we've got the servers and, Oh, we've got the, the old data from this old game and it all came together. I'm worried that, that that's not going to be available for us to make the next thing. Mm-hmm. But I would, I would love to be able to walk down the street and be notified that so-and-so um, had a virtual deck of whatever, and um, we could just have a you know 15-second battle real fast, and boom, we do the thing, whatever it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's Harry Potter wands, or maybe it's not. I'm, I'm kind of... I'm still holding holding out for kind of like what I was hoping Pokemon Go would have been in the first place, which is basically just... Pokemon, the MMO, 
in the, in real, the real world. world. And exactly. I can walk up to someone and like, hey, when two trainers eyes meet, they got a battle. Uh, we're going to throw down right here and have an actual Pokemon battle. Yeah. On that the was the greatest mistake they made, I think, mm-hmm. is that you couldn't have PvP battle. And I, I suspect it's coming for Pokemon. I'm not worried about yeah. Pokemon. What I'm worried about is the next game that won't exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, I, I don't know. I would don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's coming for Pokemon Go. Like you said, it's our, its user base has already dropped, you know, drastically. So I don't know if they're necessarily going to put that much effort into making something like that, which I think would be a pretty big um, addition to the game. If they marketed it right, they could bring all those players back. Maybe. Especially if it was the PvP element. I, I just think that if they're going to do that, I think it would be, from a marketing standpoint, easier to make a new game, even if it's still Pokemon, and call it that. Call it, like, Pokemon, Pokemon Go Battle, and now it's a whole new game. Yeah, I agree with that. I that think they would sense. probably do that. And, and that would actually fit Pokemon, because there's always a new Pokemon thing coming out. Yeah. Um, so that makes sense. I, but, I think they would have to rebrand it. Yeah. Po- Pokemon Go Silver. You know. but, or uh, <laughs> Pokemon World, even. Sure. Yeah, sure. sure. That works. But, but don't don't get too hung up on the Pokemon thing. Mm. Um, like I said, I'm not even playing that game. Jokemon. Sure. That's not, that's not, there you go. That's not my point. My point is. Digimon? A- AR as a fundamental game genre, I fear is not going to make it. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to have been a, an interesting little fad that happened uh, in the in the late 2010s. I, 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 I disagree, Doc. I think I Actually, think I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about I'm it. I'm very optimistic. In fact, I think the, the, the fun little fad is going to be VR. I think AR is where it's at. I've said that before. I said that maybe a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I stand by that comment. I think... Until, I agree with if, you on VR. Yeah, until we get to full, like, actual real VR that's approaching Matrix levels, mm-hmm. I don't think VR is going to be of much interest to people but ar because you're there you're mixing the digital with the reality and because we are so close to having something like remember the google glasses that we're mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. for a while mm-hmm. those if, things if are coming, lens wasn't as limited as it is right those things are coming fa- faster than we think and once they're there these companies are going to bend over backwards to do things like have ui for our lives have like huds <laughs> for our lives and that's just a one little step away from having all these little ar game experiences mm-hmm. In our everyday life. I would be like, more uh, optimistic if the Switch didn't have such rarity and was competing with other phones like Apple for basic parts like LCD screens. Right, but I, th- I, but I think that's, that's just a, that's limited. Like once there's more of those around, there's going to be more, even more factories. I mean, it's just it's supply-demand. Like right now, there's just – they can't make enough of that product because they just don't feel like they can sell enough. So, yes, there's a limitation there, like you're saying. Uh, Part of that is Nintendo's business model. That's true. They only make what they can sell. But I think once it becomes those things are needed by everyone because AR is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then all of a sudden there's a lot more factories doing the same thing. It's going to be be driven by the mobile market. Once mobile goes AR, then it's going to become mainstream, and then it's going to be... That makes sense. And and glasses, too. I think like wearables. You know, wearables are coming more and more, Mm -hmm. and... They're still they're still kind of gimmicky, but I think people want that. People still see sci-fi and they see all these cool. Oh, I can put on these glasses and I can see these. I can look at someone and I can look at Chris and I can see information about him because you know we're friends or whatever. And like I, and and we've shared something. And I go, what's Chris? Oh, what's your phone number? I forgot. Oh, I see it floating above your head because you've given me access mm-hmm. to do so. Mm-hmm. Things like that. That's coming pretty damn soon. And someone's going to listen to this and they're going to steal that idea and they're going to make a billion dollars. Damn it! <laughs> Cut that out. So send Jim's cut to woke Jim. Yeah, please send me, send me, just, just give me a little bit of cut of that. Give me a little, give me a little taste. But uh, Chris, uh, what, what is your gaming holy grail? So, and this is kind of like it's, it's, it's similar and dissimilar, Doc, to what you were saying. Your old holy grail was mm-hmm. um, uh, games being able to tell stories. It's not necessarily that I want them to be able to replace our mode of storytelling. But I want to see, we've talked before about emergent elements in games, sort of emergent stories, cool things that sort of are born out of the system that we think are kind of cool, that kind of define our playthrough. I want to see games that can, in a way, be the ultimate GM in a, and this is like GM of tabletop games, at least in a mechanical sense, if not also, and to some extent, an ability to portray characters. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, and there are actually some interesting projects out there. If you guys have ever heard of um, Liarbird, it's basically a audio processing API that's open source um, that is able to, in theory, imitate human speech. It's like the same idea as like Siri and other projects along those lines, um, where 
it's generated though, instead of necessarily you just record someone and then sort of like take all the speech parts and string them together. Um, you have the different phonemes. Uh, in theory, what it's supposed to be able to do is listen to you for about a minute or listen to anything for about a minute and imitate the voice. Now, like right, a specific voice? Yes. Like your voice? So one of the demos they did is they That's had terrifying. a conversation between Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump about Lyrebird. Um, and it's right now it's in a very sort of like preliminary stage where it's like you can tell it's not actually them. You can tell it's computerized voice. Well, well did, it, did, it, did their conversation devolve into um, name calling? Uh, no, it did not. Then uh, I could tell it's not them. It was scripted. Or at least not, not Trump. <laughs> that must be yeah. why they call it liar. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the point of bringing this up, though, is that we, are, we have technologies that are moving in the direction of um, possibly being able to replace voice acting. Now, there's always going to be the human element of performance, but if in if at the very least you could have programmable inflection, where as the writer I'm saying, I want this to be read angrily or something like that. Um, so, so essentially what you're saying, Chris, is that you want voice actors to no longer be able to find work. <laughs> I'm not saying that I want that. I'm saying that I think this is the direction you're, we might be going. You're saying wants to no, replace no, everyone no. with robots. You're, you're saying this is this is your holy grail now. Now means that's what you want. I'm, to I'm using this to set up my holy grail. Oh, okay, my okay. holy grail, I think, is the ability for a computer, a game, to adapt very on a very granular level, level, but also on a very broad level, like very um, large scale level to what the player is doing and how they're playing you stick them in a world and they can do pretty much whatever they want and the world's going to react to it in a meaningful way what what sort of game is this like a sandbox is this basically like a sandbox, a sandbox rpg what sort of thing it's yeah. called no man's sky <laughs> and what happens is you get in a spaceship and <laughs> so no i see because it has to this would only take, take place in a certain type of game like mm-hmm. you're not saying for example I want Final Fantasy 16 to be this. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I want it to be something... Like, Give me an example of a real-world game that we already have that you can draw a comparison to say, I like this game, the style of this game, but I want it to have this element so that we kind of know. Like, I'm assuming you don't mean, I like Tetris. I want Tetris to be this, right? Oh, no, no. You don't mean every game. Yeah. You mean a certain type of game. Uh, The Skyrims of the world. So Skyrim. Not not necessarily because I love Skyrim, but because Skyrim makes me wish for this sort of thing. So (laughs) So not Grand Theft Auto. Which is it, where it, I thought you were going with it. It could be Grand it, Theft Auto. But you went with Skyrim. It could be Grand Theft Auto. But the, the idea is that like it, it would be if Grand Theft Auto allowed for more role play. Um, well, just if you played Skyrim, it doesn't really allow for much I, role I know, play I know. at all. And so that's why I'm saying that it, it could be Grand Theft Auto or it could be Skyrim. The idea would be that the role play would kind of be the thing that would be added. And not just dialogue options, but I could speak to the computer. It can understand what I'm saying, speak back intelligently with the knowledge of that character in mind. Um, so, so let me ask you this. What would you do with this? Like this, this now exists. Basically just open world RPG. But, but what would you do? Like what's your first, you're in this world. Mm-hmm. What do you do? I mean, it could be any number of things. It could, you're, you're in Skyrim. It, it has this technology. What do you do? I can go up and ask any question I want. Great. Go up and ask a question. What question would you ask? Again, it could be anything. This is theoretical. <laughs> so. No, but the point, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of making okay. a point here. Mm-hmm. And the point that I'm making is if the story is still, you're in, it's Skyrim. It mm-hmm. is Skyrim, but you have this technology. You're probably going to be asking about the things that the, the developers have already set you up to be able to ask about. More than likely. Because they're relevant to that game. So if, just because you can go up to a, an NPC and, and ask them about the color of their socks doesn't mean you're going to because that's irrelevant. And that might be well, fun and this for is a the, few minutes. This is the sort of stuff that came up in these discussions we right. had back in grad school. Um, and probably what you would do is have it so that they wouldn't acknowledge you or they would think you're super weird. And basically the, the game would give you consequences for doing things like asking about the it, color of their socks. It sounds like to me like what – what you're basically saying here, it sounds very similar to old text parser games. I'm sure you've played. Actually, yeah, I was thinking the same these, thing. Where um, essentially you, you get to type in whatever you want, mm-hmm. anything to say to someone. But and then then the, the, the computer system, you know, picks out parts of what you said and then interprets it and then re- returns a response. It's a very rudimentary concept, but it's similar to what you're mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. Now, yours involves voice acting. Mm-hmm. I understand that. That's a very that's the very diff- challenging part. I mm-hmm. think it's the voice acting element. Yeah. But remove the voice acting element and just have text. And to me, it sounds very similar mm-hmm. to a text parser. Instead of selecting from a dialogue t- tree, mm-hmm. you get to type in your question. Yeah. And by doing so, you can ask 
anything. Yeah. Now, they may not respond, like you said. Mm-hmm. They, they might say, if I ask about their socks, that's probably gonna, anything like that is going to be flagged as, as this is some weird question I'm not going to mm-hmm. need to respond to. So I'll just you know, respond by saying, wow, you're, you're a weird dude, and mm-hmm. then just walk away, conversation yeah. in. And there are a lot of ways that we could kind of fake this. I guess what I'm talking about is the holy grail would be the ability to have it be robust enough that even – like it will recognize what it is I'm talking about when I ask about the color of their socks, but then it would also come up with a kind of like believable in character response that either sort of like shows that they have no idea what you're talking about, but isn't just like kind of the same stock mm-hmm. answer or two. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I could see this being interesting if it's put into the context of a simulation. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you're in a if you're in a world like Skyrim or Fallout. Um, Skyrim being medieval, like ish, obviously it's fantasy, but based on medieval times, like that mentality, right? Mm-hmm. Or Fallout, which is a post apocalyptic. Mm-hmm. Both of them are basically a very much a, a quote Wild West type mentality, mm-hmm. where if you go up to the wrong person and you say something that you shouldn't say, you will probably be killed. Because no, because it's lawless enough. Even mm-hmm. though there is law, it's lawless enough that it that it poses a danger. Mm-hmm. What you do, like we don't have that in our modern modern life. So I'm talking about those sort of systems. So I think that could be interesting. Where, um, there, but there has to be, my point is there has to be real consequences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it's something like the whole sock question, if you go up and ask someone a weird question about their sock, mm-hmm. like let's say if I was in, um, you know, like medieval. Um, England or medieval France or something, and I go up to a nobleman and I ask him a silly question about their socks, there's a real chance that I could be Tossed thrown out. in prison. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a real chance that that could happen because they have all the power and I'm a peasant and I have no power. Mm-hmm. So there needs to be real consequences. Yeah. Otherwise, if they just respond with like, ha ha, silly guy, you're mm-hmm. stupid, and then the conversation ends, mm-hmm. it's kind of defeats the purpose and of this that's right? basically what i'm talking about yeah is that like the the holy grail here is an all-encompassing simulation that can account for stuff like that uh that, say like if we put you in skyrim we don't even necessarily like we we might sort of have a quest in the sense that we sort of seed events that are going to possibly end the world mm-hmm. if you don't react to them but then things are kind of running in the background as i'm playing that like if i don't do or don't do something forces are still in motion that are going to very meaningfully affect the world mm-hmm. and basically sort of, well, that sounds like, like you're also expecting it to have a timer that's constantly running. Yeah. Probably. So what if, I mean, that's viable. And sure. So no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's all it's stuff viable, that, but doesn't that, it's all stuff that we could design, right? Yeah. It's all stuff that we could do given enough hardware, given enough, whatever, but having something that's this all encompassing, that you have to manually make is just not feasible. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a game called, I think, Samurai Sword. I think that's right. That basically did that. You could literally do nothing and the story would play itself out Mm -hmm. or you could interfere. And then at the end, it showed you how much of the story you had changed and you played it again Mm -hmm. and again. And it was short. Um, what, What I'm hearing you say, Chris, that I am intrigued by is that not you not that you want the system to create the robust overarching story, Mm -hmm. but to have a small level of control over the tiny little details of the story. And what that takes me back to is our discussion about Westworld. Yeah, and it, a game it, like it Westworld does sound exists. similar to that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that intrigues me because one of my pet peeves um, in any video game ever is you say a thing to an NPC and they give you the dialogue and then you're like, uh, okay, now I need to... I need to ask that question again. If I missed something, and you you get the exact same line of dialogue yeah. thrown back at you. Really good games, and enjoyable games, won't give you the same line of dialogue. They'll give you something else. Sometimes they have fun with it. Sometimes they, you know, they they'll they'll be like, okay, since you weren't listening the first time, let me say it again. And then it'll give mm-hmm. the same line or they'll have recorded it two or three different ways and they'll mm-hmm. give it to you. And, and, yeah. and, and that's a yeah. huge amount of work. I, yeah. yeah. I think there, there's that issue. Obviously it's going to make it very difficult. I think there's also possibly an issue of the way the public might perceive it because there's extra elements that you have to add to a game like this. Otherwise, because the big, the big point part of this is that you're trying to make it, um, you know, 
easier to suspend your disbelief, right? Because you, you have these more realistic responses is what I'm hearing. So, right? I mean, that's basically what's more going or less. It's not. Responses. It's not just about the dialogue. It's about the the game world exactly. reacting to you. So, in that case, for example, mm-hmm. in a world like Skyrim or Fallout, you need a situation where what like if if I go up to an NPC and they are an important quest NPC and I need this NPC, I can kill this NPC. I have now lost the game because I kill. I cannot beat the main game, but mm. that has to be possible. Yeah. For example. Yeah, yeah. Even though you may not know. That that was the NPC that you had that you could kill mm-hmm. because you don't want to have some something come up like a little error message, warning. This this NPC is crucial to your game. Mm-hmm. You should, like if you, <laughs> you kill this, you don't you know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. But so it, instead, you have you the can't system. Have that. Yeah, you have the system be robust enough that when eventually the dragon comes, that only that person could slay. Maybe someone else else like for at another time, someone else under different circumstances says, "Man, I sure wish so and so was still around. They would know what to sure. do about this." Yes, and then you go, <laughs> "Oh well, it looks like I lost." 20, 20, 30, 40, 50 hours of, of work. I got to restart. So I'm just pointing that out. The other, the other thing about it too is that you also have to allow for, you have to allow for brutality is kind of what I want to get into. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that, again, is is we're just sort of, we've touched on in some games. And I'm talking about the torture scene from Grand Theft Auto V, which was very disturbing, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that, this ha- these things have to be possible not just for, I don't just mean you torturing someone, but mm-hmm. someone torturing you. These are things that could happen if we're talking about a world like Skyrim or Fallout, when we're talking about these worlds where it's very lawless. So we have things. We can't have NPCs that can't be killed. We can't have, and that isn't, and I'm, I'm including like, like the very famous, the Skyrim children that dance around mm-hmm. inside Dragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they have to be, a Dragon comes by, that, that kid is now torched and is, you know, ashes. That's, mm-hmm. Because that's what would happen if a dragon was breathing fire there. So you're, you're removing that suspension of disbelief, but there's also this kind of safety net by doing that where bad things happen, but things that aren't, nothing that's too bad, nothing that's going to offend too many people. So you do kind of also open yourself up to that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and is, is the population mature enough to handle something like that? I think as a human species, I think we have a ways to go before we can even implement this idea, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. If that if, if that kind of makes sense. No, it does make sense. And I think that there are ways to that through smart design, because where the designer would come in in this is they would be there would be this system that is designed to take certain inputs and then act off of it. Yeah. And so you could, for instance, like, you know, have the same sort of thing, but you limit it to an environment where, say, there aren't any children or something like that, because you're focusing on like a very specific say it's happening on a military base or it's happening during wartime out at sea or like there's any number of ways you could say like we're not going to have you know children that you can murder here but then also you have the world react believably to hey if you murder a child game over i I, I like more of of a well it depends i mean that's not really believable though in the medieval and especially if like if you become a for example um you work yourself up to be like in Skyrim terms, you're like the arch wizard or something. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you want. I mean, in like in medieval times, if you're like, say, like a like a, a land baron or something, mm-hmm. and some peasant comes up, it doesn't matter who they are, their age, anything. If they if they look at you cross eyed, mm-hmm. you can just decide, hey, I'm just gonna kill them. <laughs> yeah, they're not gonna see you. Right. I'm not saying I'm not saying that you should do yeah. that. I'm My, not I'm not entirely sure that the example holds though, whenever you look at it from a historical perspective, because we can't we can't get away from the fact that these are Wish fulfillment fantasies. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they are a story based world. They're a, you know a narrative space. Sure. In that regard, maybe a better example would be to talk about Scarborough Fair down in Waxahachie, which is about forty minutes south of Dallas, right? And and, and or maybe a Texas Renaissance Festival down in, uh, in a very flooded Houston. Um, what what basically we're um, we're talking about when we talk about those spaces is LARP light. Right. Mm-hmm. It's I'm going to go. Sometimes people dress up. My wife and I do. Uh, sometimes that, you don't. That's but a, that's a great example. I don't you know, I don't I don't do the um, the English accent when I go there. Right. And I'm not ever mistaken for the players mm-hmm. who are consistent, employed actors who live the lifestyle. Right. Right. But if I go up to one of the king's men who I can readily identify and say, sir, what color are your socks? He is going to stay in character. 
He is going to respond in, in, in such a way that is appropriate to the anachronism. And at the same time, he is going to make it fun and entertaining for me and for my three-year-old son. And it, if he's good, if he's really, really good, that's going to become this moment that we talk about after we go home. And so totally putting words into your mouth here, Chris, mm. if we can simulate that aspect of the fantasy, I think we're on to something. The irony, of course, being that you need something so incredibly robust and so incredibly advanced in order to be able to simulate the mundane that you're talking about systems which have systems which have yep. systems which have systems. And that's why it's a holy grail. And that's why it's a holy grail. Yes. I mean, I think you'd be much better off, uh, better served, to, as a starting point to look at, I mean, the text parser is is where the beginnings of it should be. Mm-hmm. And, they sh- and if mm-hmm. they had developed that system, we had kept with the text parser as opposed to moving moving to, um, we mo- first we moved to dialogue trees, which were text. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then once once we moved there, we replaced the dialogue trees with, um, voice responses. Are you familiar with uh, Starship Titanic? Do you remember that one? No. Okay, that one was interesting. It was an early transmedia entry, but it was Douglas Adams. It's the the thing. If 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 like me, you lament the fact that Douglas Adams only published like six things. I got news for you: Starship Titanic. It's garbage. But it's out there. And the thing of it was, um, there was a little novel. There was a um, a video game, and what you were supposed to be able to do was uh, type anything, and that was your interface. Well, there was this uh, bottleneck moment where if if you didn't do the right thing with the chicken, it's like a frozen chicken, you lost. You were five or six hours into the game, yeah, but you you had no real context clues on what to do because it was it was simulationist in that regard. But if you threw it down the garbage chute, it was gone forever. And there was no forward progression. So in a time whenever text-based games, which that one was a hybrid, but uh, in a time when text-based games basically um, had that mentality, it was a failure in a commercial sense. And people really disliked the game because they, they felt like it was too real. Yeah. That would be my concern with this kind of a thing is if, if we enter into the space and we don't expect it to be simulationist and it's a little too real, we're not going to have fun. Mm. Yeah. And it's uh, about finding that balance. Of you got to, you got to simulate the right thing. And you know, Jim, what you're talking earlier about like, you know, killing the guy who's the only one who could kill the dragon. You don't design it to only one person can kill the dragon. It's just that killing that one person changes the way in which you have to approach the game. That's a terrible game. story. Yeah. I agree. Well, I was, I, that was a, not necessarily you, you came up with the killing the dragon. Well, but, I, I said, but it was based on something else. He's then. an important quest giver. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that now you can't get that mm. quest or you can't finish that yeah. quest. The point is that we both have consequence, but we also allow for a lot of freedom. Sure. I think the beginnings of something like this that would be easier to do, the text parser would be one. Mm-hmm. And then another would be to look at something like simulate your life as a peasant. Because then if you are, if you, instead of being like, you're the dragonborn. No, you're a peasant. Mm-hmm. Well, what if I go up and try to kill this? No, you get killed. Yeah. What if I try to, no, you, you die. Mm-hmm. So it's like, instead of you kind of avoid a lot of those problems because you're basically a nobody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now that could be, that could be um, possibly a fun experience in itself because you get to see how long can I survive as a peasant, but mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun to see, okay, if I go up to this guard and I ask him about his socks, how quickly will he kill me or will he just throw me in prison? You know, like you have these, I mean, you could even, you could even get a start on this by trying to just like manually design a super robust time loop game. Where like you can only go so many places and it only lasts so much That's time. A neat solution, but you uh, like it's kind of like uh, Majora's Mask turned up yeah. to eleven. Mm-hmm. I think another another point about this too, because you you mentioned relating it to a uh, tabletop game, mm-hmm. a tabletop RPG, and I have had you know we've all had that experience where we're playing a tabletop RPG and everyone's into the story, mm-hmm. so it works. So everyone is is interacting with people in a way that. Bolt, bolsters the game world and mm-hmm. bolsters the story. Yeah. There's also the reverse of that, where you're just trying to, you're trying to have fun, but you don't care if you're creating chaos. And that's when you get into situations like what I was saying, where the person decides, I want to kill the quest giver, mm-hmm. right? Hypothetically, let's say there is this one quest giver that you need. Maybe you can create another quest giver. Great, I kill that guy too. Mm-hmm. Well, I have another one. He's dead too. But I, okay, this guy's dead too. Well, so you're just making your own fun then, basically. Right, but you see kind of like there's that element of, 
when you give people all this freedom, you also are giving them the freedom to essentially break, the break game. your game. And mm-hmm. then, it's, then it becomes a situation of, yeah, okay, well, but maybe they like doing that. Okay, great, but why even design that in? Mm. So you kind of have that almost like um, almost a catch-22 where you're doing all this extra work. And that was kind of the point I was originally making, mm-hmm. um, is that it feels like you're doing a lot of this extra work when really the designers are already trying to cull those sort of reactions mm-hmm. where they feel like this is the dragonborn wouldn't go around and kill children so you shouldn't be able to do it mm-hmm. the dragonborn wouldn't wouldn't kill this guy this quest giver that's important so why should you be able you know so they're, they're calling the, uh, they're, they're calling some of these responses because that's not what your character in this game world in this game space should do mm-hmm. so i feel i mean i think what you're saying could totally work in a certain type of game mm-hmm. i just don't i just disagree that it would need to be a robust system that would work in all sorts of open world sandbox games like Skyrim. I think it would have to be, it would have to fit the game that you're making, in my opinion. Yeah, and there could be different parts that you do or don't simulate. But I think now we're starting to see how these holy grails can lead to much, much longer discussions mm-hmm. that we <laughs> so have no more time for today, unfortunately. So it's fine. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode one hundred and ten of the Backward Dash Compatible dot com podcast. Our discussion on holy grails in gaming. Uh, we just want to remind you that. Um, we are trying to grow the show, and um, we really appreciate it if you tell your friends, um, if you share um, our posts, like our posts, uh, share us on social media, um, talk about us in person. Uh, say, hey, I heard this really cool show. Would you like to listen to it? Um, Where can I download this in-person app that you're referring to? In-person app. Well, uh, you can communicate with us on, on Twitter um, at Backward Compat if you would like to talk to us. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm actually usually... Uh, running that account so if you send me a message i can i can respond with the account uh and you communicate with us there i mean if you send us some messages we'll also communicate back wow you can also send us an email um inbox at backward compatible.com i got that right that's correct good um and uh if you if you want to send information specifically to one of the co-hosts you can do that too um if you would like to uh send me hate mail which i'm sure i deserve plenty of it <laughs> Um, you, it, you can just put a uh, gym bag or hashtag gym bag somewhere in the subject line. And I will read the hate mail on the air as long as it's not uh, full of curse words and uh, we can all have a good time with it. <laughs> or if you are wrong and you think Jim was right, you can also do hashtag woke Jim. Yeah. Woke Jim. <laughs> hashtag woke Jim. If I, if I, if I'm proven to be woke, um, but also you can ask us questions. You can, you can suggest uh, topics. Um, these are all things that we, that we would love to consider and talk about. Um, yeah. And uh, let us know what you think uh, your Holy Grails are. Is there something out there that we didn't mention today that you would love to see in games that uh, may or may not be impossible? Totally, totally. And how, yeah. how wrong was I with, with bashing Chris, Chris's idea for some reason? I don't know why I got off on that tangent doing so. <laughs> yeah, how playing, wrong playing devil's I? advocate, that's how, what you do. How, <laughs> right, how terrible was I? You, you, you can go ahead and write it and say, no, Jim, you're wrong. Here's why. And we'd love to hear it. See, what we really need is a game that has all three of these things. Mm-hmm. It's augmented reality with procedural content and whatever it was you said. Im- improvised action. Yeah, that. Improvised action. Yeah. That kind of fits in, kind of. Uh... Actually, it does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.